Bionicle Legends is the third book series based in the Bionicle universe. It ended in 2008 and was succeeded by a new, final three book series, titled Bionicle Super Chapter Books. Bionicle Legends covered the events that occurred in the storyline's 2006-2008 story arc. It follows the Bionicle Adventures series, but as Adventures is almost exclusively told in flashbacks, the events preceding those in Legends are told in the first book series, Bionicle Chronicles. In Bionicle Legends, the great spirit Mata Nui is dying, and the universe will die with him if nothing is done. A new group of Toa must find the Mask of Life that can save him before it is too late, but other, more sinister groups also desire such a powerful mask for their own purposes. The 2006 Arc of Legends was adapted into the Bionicle Heroes video game. Despite not being named as such on the titles, the 2009 book, Raid on Vulcanus was labeled as being part of Bionicle Legends on some websites. However, it was actually part of another book series, Bionicle Super Chapter Books. Topic. Sources The main events of the Legends story arc are told in the Bionicle Legends books, there were originally eight planned through 2007, and the series will continued past that in 2008. The titles of the released novels are, Island of Doom, Dark Destiny, Power Play, Legacy of Evil, Inferno, City of the Lost, Prisoners of the Pit, Downfall, Shadows in the Sky, Swamp of Secrets, and The Final Battle. The Bionicle, Ignition comic book series, distributed to LEGO Club members and later published online at Bionicle.com, issues hash 1 to 5, issues number 6 number 15. The first of the four level 3 young reader Bionicle books, which is, Bionicle, Journey of Takanuva, the following sources provide background information and tell side stories taking place during Bionicle Legends. The Bionicle, Dark Hunter's Guide, written from the perspective of the Hunter's leader, the Shadowed One, during the 2006 portion of Bionicle Legends. The Bionicle World Guide, written from the perspective of the Order of Mata Nui, during the 2007 portion of Bionicle Legends. The Bionicle, Makuta's Guide to the Universe book, written from the perspective of Makuta Teritix, during the 2008 portion of Bionicle Legends. The following short stories. Dreams of Destruction, Gali Nuva's blog, Into the Darkness, Dark Mirror, and Destiny War at BionicleStory.com. The Kingdom Short Story, unlocked only by uploading the code on the back cover of the Bionicle Legends No. 10, Swamp of Secrets book, which can only work for a LEGO Club account member. The short story was later released on the Bionicle Sector 01 website, for everybody to read. Select elements from the Voya Nui online game are canonical, mainly the Rahi species present on Voya Nui and the various kinds of Nectan seen. The Hope short story, hosted on Bionicle Sector 01. Topic. Legends Topic. Plot summary 2006. Topic. Island of Doom The reconstruction of Metru Nui is underway as the Turaga call a meeting with the Toa Nuva and Toa Takanuva. Turaga Doom and Nuju reveal their discovery. By studying the stars, they have found the Great Spirit has fallen from his coma-like state and is dying. After his death, the universe will die along with it in three days. His only chance of survival is if the Toa Nuva recover the legendary Kanohi Ignika, the Mask of Life, to save him. Doom leads the Toa Nuva underground to Toa Canisters and sends them off to the island of Voya Nui while Toa Takanuva stays behind to guard the metropolis. On Voya Nui, the Paraka, Zaktan, Avak, Thok, Rydak, Vayak, and Hakan, arrive and masquerade as Toa. Despite their claims, it is their frightening appearance and demeanor which primarily makes the Mataran natives fall into the Paraka's plot. Thus, the Mataran survivalists are convinced, and begin the construction of the Paraka's fortress, the stronghold, as well as temples and statues in their honor. They are also used to dig trenches for lava farming out of Mount Valmai to search for the Ignica. 
This makes six Mataran suspicious of their claims, and form the Voya Nui resistance team. They watch the Paraka closely and take place in the theft of a mysterious artifact they created, a Zamor launcher, ultimately believing they will use the weapon against them. Meanwhile, in Metru Nui, Yalar, a Ta Mataran and close friend to Takanuva, the Toa of Light, begins to suspect that the Turaga were hiding something from the Mataran. He and Takanuva confronted them about this but when the Turaga refused to reveal the truth, Yalar staged a Metru-wide boycott i.e. the Mataran all stop repairing the damage to Metru Nui and would not end it until the Turaga tell the Mataoran what's going on. After skirmishes with the Paraka, including Dalu's attempt to increase Avak's senses, Hakan and Avak create a monster of rock and lava to fool the Mataran, and defeat the monster, hopefully to better the Paraka's image. Using Antidermis, a mysterious substance that the Paraka have found on the island, Zaktan creates a Zamor sphere to test upon a Ta Mataran subject named Dazalk, which makes the Mataran obedient and loyal, sending him to assemble the Mataran where the Paraka enslave the Voya Nui Mataran save the resistance team. Meanwhile, the Toa Nuva arrive, and despite the resistance team's intervention, are surprised and defeated by the Paraka after a fierce battle. Zaktan commands their tools and Kanohi are to be stripped, and the Toa Nuva to burn in Mount Valmai. During this time, Balta, in an attempt to steal a Zamor sphere, traps himself in a cave. Back on Metru Nui, Yalar organizes a labor strike until the Turaga divulge the Toa Nuva's sudden disappearance, believing the Mataran have been protected too closely for far too long. Turaga Nokama meets with Yalar secretly to reveal the truth about Mata Nui and the Toa Nuva's mission. Topic. Dark Destiny On Metru Nui, Turaga Doom holds a conference with the Turaga. He reviews the events of the previous meeting and confesses his doubts on the Toa Nuva, who have not returned with the Ignika. More importantly, he accuses the Turaga of revealing this, as Takanuva and Yalar recruited five of the Brevest Mataran to mount a rescue mission, the team departed the night before, vanishing into the underwater chutes of La Metru. Nokama confesses, and the Turaga are forced to wait as Takanuva is not available to dispatch. At the same time, Takanuva, Yalar and the other five Mataran emerges from a chute onto a land bridge. Takanuva attempts to unsuccessfully persuade Yalar to return to Metru Nui and let him continue the mission, and scouts ahead up a tunnel. When he uses his light powers to illuminate the tunnel, he finds his light powers are disabled in the tunnel, and becomes disoriented and confused. After a while, the Mataran team decide to enter the tunnel, their lightstones fail, and they link themselves with cable and continue to talk to ensure they would not become separated. Matoro, one of the six Mataran, is worried as Nuju said the way to Voya Nui was through a land of the dead, but is ignored. He then no longer hears his allies' voices even when he shouts, and stumbles in the darkness. He feels a hand grab out to him and helps the figure to his feet, and continues to follow the cable, where the Mataran and Takanuva await. The figure is no longer in the tunnel, and is revealed to be an extension of the Kanohi Ignika. They continue down a long strip of land, with a stone archway far away. Yalar offers if anyone wants to turn away do so now, but no one declines. Holly wonders about Takanuva and Teritix, and if Teritix's defeat was intentional, and Hyuki finds a Kanohi Saletu, Takanuva acknowledging its existence by wearing the Kanohi and listening on Halley's thoughts. The team sets down close to the archway, Yalar standing guard as the Mataran slept. Yalar questions Matoro's attitude after they escape the tunnel, but they are interrupted by Takanuva sighting a Mataran in the archway, which awakens the others. They continue toward the archway, Takanuva explaining that the Mataran disappeared before contact was made, and he attempts to pass through the archway only to be repelled, along with the power of light. The Mataran pass through the archway, but are unable to get back. Holly warns them from a tablet she found, describing that, This is a realm of shadow, of famine and plague and blight. This is a world of darkness and there is no place for light. Sadly, Takanuva is forced to depart for Metru Nui again and the Mataran continue onward, with a message to update the Turaga and not send any assistance. The team continues up a mountain, and are met by eight manas. 
They are led into a canyon of Matarin in various states of disrepair. The land is desolate, waterfalls of dust, volcanoes of hot ice, thunderless lighting and thunder producing water. The ground screams as they walk past stone statues of Matarin and the unrepaired Matarin follow them. They are led to an armored being, with a horrific patchwork mask and chains of fire. His name is Karzani, the ruler of this land named in his honor. Holly remembers this place from the Turaga's tales, where lazy Matarin were sent. Karzani describes a hundred thousand years ago, Matarin of laziness and disrepair were sent here, and when the team mentions Mata Nui would not accept such a place, he is confused. The Matarin then confiscate the Matarin's supplies and tools to strip their identity, and when asked for their masks, Yaller refuses, knowing that his Kanohi Hau was belonged to the late Toa Lakan. He is forced to carry out his wishes when Karzani gives him a vision of an alternate future where Takua dies. The Matarin are repurposed, Holly works with Karzani. As the chronicler, she educates him in the events of the past hundred centuries. The other Matarin are put to work in the furnaces, where they meet an avenue Matarin who resided there before the light barrier archway was constructed. With his mind broken, he rambles about his previous identity, working in a world that feeds the world, where he constructed the Toa canisters. He reveals a set where hidden in Karzani, and despite his warnings that Matarin would not survive the journey, they journey underground to them. Karzani tries to stop them, but when Matoro goads him, he gives a vision of the death of the Great Spirit and its effects. The vision is so appalling that the tyrant hesitates, and Yaller's team escape for Voya Nui. On Voya Nui, the Paraka carry the unconscious Toa Nuva to Mount Valmai, but an eruption stops them from doing so, and they flee. The Toa Nuva regain consciousness in time to save themselves. After recovering, the run into the Voya Nui resistance team, but the group believes them as threats as well, and they attack the Toa Nuva, who refuse to retaliate against that which they chose to protect. Gali Nuva is driven insane when Dalu enhances her sight, and flees from the area, coming into the custody of Axon, who heals her and frees Balta from the cave. The two return to the conflict and the Toa Nuva and Mataran ally, and they journey for the Paraka's stronghold to find the Nuva's Kanohi and tools. Meanwhile, Zaktan is furious upon the Toa Nuva's survival. He reveals the Paraka's seventh member, Vezin, briefly, and sends Thok to work the Mataran harder, as the volcano had slowed after the eruption. Zaktan later meets with Brutaka, and Hakan overhears. He fires a Zamor sphere at the Titan, which only appears to make him stronger. He follows the gold and blue armored warrior, and strikes a deal that if he can control the Zamor spheres, he can grant them to Brutaka, they two journey to the stronghold. Coincidentally, Avak and Thok, searching for the Toa by the green belt of Voya Nui, realize the Ignica must be hidden there, and conclude Zaktan was using Mount Valmai as a diversion. They retreat to the Paraka stronghold to confront him. A battle begins within the stronghold between the Paraka. Rydik attempts to enter the stronghold and encounters the Toa Nuva, accidentally aiding them in getting inside. The Toa Nuva recover their tools and masks. Zaktan once again resumes control of Brutaka, offering the secret of Antidermis. Brutaka defeats the Toa Nuva and the Mataran, and he takes the Toa into his custody. The Paraka, whose loose alliance is now on the verge of being completely broken, interrogate the Mataran. Just offshore from Voya Nui, the transport pods carrying Yaller and the others arrives just as the mysterious red star shoots a bolt of energy at the canisters. The bolt splits into six and strikes them. When the Mataran emerged, they were no longer Mataran, but Toa. Topic. Power play From afar, Axon watches the defeat of the Toa Nuva and the Voya Nui resistance team. He reflects upon how they ended up there. Axon and Brutaka are part of an organization named the Order of Mata Nui, devoted to the Great Spirit. They were assigned to protect the Kanohi Ignica on Voya Nui. Unfortunately, Brutaka lost faith within their mission, as Voya Nui separated itself from the southern continent and the Great Cataclysm. Soon, Brutaka betrayed his mission to ally himself with the Paraka to ultimately steal the Kanohi Ignica. Brutaka, as well ponders his history, while aiding the Paraka in interrogating the Voya Nui resistance team, and when Dalu attempts an escape, he saves her from a doom viper. 
He leaves, troubled by his choices. After the incident, Garen is questioned, and the Paraka are troubled by the sight of six spirit stars, specifically the Toa Anikas. Vayak attempts to throw him in a crevice of lava, but he is rescued by the Voya Nui resistance team. Meanwhile, the Toa Anika start to figure out their next move, noting especially odd things about their transformation like glowing faces and living masks. They end up triggering their mask powers, causing chaos as Nuparu flies uncontrollably, Kongu can't keep from hearing others' thoughts, Matoro's spirit is separated from his body, and Holly seems to be talking to thin air. As they regain control, Matoro reports that he saw the Matoran, and the Toa agree that they need to meet them and figure out what's going on in this island. After a scuffle with Vayok, the Toa meet the Matoran rebels and compare notes on what they know. Armed with Zamor launchers built by Velika, they split up into three groups, Yalar and Holly go to free enslaved Matoran, Hyuki and Matoro go visit Axon, and Kongu and Nuparu sneak into the Paraka stronghold to search for the Toa Nuva. While Yalar and Halley's mission has no problems, Hyuki and Matoro find Axon badly injured by Brutaka, telling them to stop his former partner even if it means killing him. Worse, Kongu and Nuparu are discovered and faced with all six Paraka and Brutaka. Thankfully, the other Toa arrive just as the battle starts and Hyuki is able to bury Brutaka under a pile of rock, taking him out of the fight temporarily. While the Matoran search the stronghold for the Toa Nuva, the Toa Anika, thanks to their unique mask powers and unpredictable fighting style due to their recent transformation, begin taking the Paraka out one by one. But the tides turn when Brutaka begins to dig himself out, Hakan enacts the plan to steal Brutaka's power for himself, Avak, Rydak, and Thok. But he intended to take it all for himself, and only quick action by Thok allowed him to take a share of Brutaka's power as well. The two quickly use their new strength to turn on the others, with Hakan knocking them all out with one superpowered mental blast. When everyone comes to, they realize that Hakan and Thok had forced the weakened Brutaka to reveal the location of the Mask of Life. Axon arrives and begins to go after the two Paraka, but Yalar tells him to swallow his pride and let others help, to which Axon agrees. Realizing that the best way to stop the two is to return Brutaka's power to him and that the Paraka are the only ones who know how to do that, the two groups form an uneasy alliance. While the Paraka work on the Zamor sphere that will depower Hakan and Thok, Axon warns Yalar of the mosque's guardians and hands him a glowing Zamor for protection. At the same time, the Matoran are continuing their search, and they find records of Voya Nui's history. It was long thought that many were lost when some of the land sank underwater, but these records say that they may still be alive underwater as a prelude to the Mari Nui story. Meanwhile, Hakan and Thok have begun to turn on each other. The resulting destruction makes them easy to track, and the Toa Anika and other Paraka quickly arrive on the scene. Axon chose to stay behind. Though most of the Paraka are taken out of the fight early, Hakan and Thok are soon put at a disadvantage by the Anika. The two call a truce and launch a combined attack, but at the same moment Hyuki hits them with the specially prepared Zamor. As a result, both sides fall unconscious from their enemy's assault, leaving only Zaktan standing. By the time the Toa Anika awaken, the Paraka are already up and gone, headed down a staircase that leads to the Mask of Life. Agreeing that they can't wait for reinforcements, they quickly follow. Topic. Legacy of Evil This portion of the storyline describes the Paraka's history, involvement in the Dark Hunters and subsequent betrayal and the events leading up to their journey to Voya Nui, described by Zaktan's experiences and tales of the Paraka. A Legacy of Evil the book was initially proposed to come with a Paraka Lego mini figure, 7,000 years prior to the events of Bionicle Legends. Vayok and Hakan, two Skakti, raid a Toa fortress in search of an artifact. As Hakan creates a fracas to distract the Toa, Vayok finds the artifact, a tablet named the Makoki Stone, with barely discernible writing detailing the Brotherhood of Makuta, in the event that they would rebel. They depart the fortress and are captured by the Dark Hunter. Ancient who confiscates the artifact and recruits the Dark Hunters along with four Skakti, Zaktan, Avak, Thok, and Rydak. Five thousand years prior to the events of Bionicle Legends, 
Zakton leads his Skaktipirs minus AVAK in an unsuccessful maneuver to overthrow the Shadowed One, but are confused by the transforming walls of the fortress. The Shadowed One attempts to execute Zakton for his treacherous leadership of the plot, but his disintegration vision instead transforms Zakton into a mass of sentient protodytes. 4,000 years prior to the events of Bionicle Legends, in a blackmail scheme, the Shadowed One sends Rydic, Vayok, and Avak to free the Kanohi Dragon from imprisonment in the seas around Metru Nui, leaving the Rahi to rampage upon the city. When the trio meet with Turaga Doom to offer protection in the event the Dark Hunters are allowed to establish a base, he declines. Therefore, Vayok attempts an assassination, but is unsuccessful due to the arrival of Toa Lakan and his Toa Mangai team. The Toa eventually defeat the beast and deport it to Shaw, where Rudaka awaits its arrival. 3,000 years prior to the events of Bionicle Legends. The Toa – Dark Hunter War, beginning as a result of Doom refusing to establish Dark Hunter bases within Metru Nui, is well underway. Hakan oversees Nidiki's betrayal and Lakan overhearing the matter. He bargains with the Toa of Fire, Nidiki for the Makoki Stone which Lakan guarded long ago. He agrees, but six months later, the Dark Hunters have it within their possession again, split into six, and auctioned to the Brotherhood at a profitable price. Rudaka then mutates Nidiki into an insectoid being, dooming him to a lifetime with the Hunters. 250 years prior to the events of Bionicle Legends, Zaktan, Thok, and Rydic guard Adina against the Brotherhood during the Dark Hunter – Brotherhood War. As the hunters are occupied with an unsuccessful Brotherhood attack of Rakshki, Exo Toa, and Vizorak, Zaktan learns from Rudaka the base was initially in the possession of the Brotherhood. Zaktan investigates the matter and uses his protodyte abilities to find an entire record of the Brotherhood and their plan. Zaktan vows to use this knowledge to his nefarious ends. One month prior to the events of Bionicle Legends, Zaktan recruits his five fellow Skakti and rebel against the hunters. Now rogue, they investigate Teritix's lair after his supposed death, which happens just as the Mataran arrive in Metru Nui. Hakan discovers the Spear of Fusion, and uses it on Vayok, dividing him into two beings, Vayok and Vezin, the latter taking his name as Vezin means, double, in Mataran. They encounter Teritix's essence as, Antidermis who subconsciously plants in their minds the ideato go to Voya Nui for the Kanohi Ignica. The seven escape the lair as his mana co come after them. They flee to the island of Mata Nui after Vezin gives them the slip, and find the Toa Mata's Toa canisters, bringing them to the beach. Avak and Zaktan chart a course to Voya Nui and Zaktan informs the Paraka to masquerade as Toa on their arrival. Hakan uses his heat vision to create a small puncture in Vezok's canister as they depart, although this act fails to kill him. Present The Paraka continue down the Hall of 777 stairs to the Kanohi Ignica, and surmise that Vezin awaits them as they found another Toa canister upon Voya Nui on their arrival. Zaktan lets Hakan lead the way, as he is plagued by the laughter of Teritix within his mind. Meanwhile, Avak discovers Hakan cowering in a corner, his armor gleaming with intense heat. Topic. Inferno The passages to the Kanohi Ignika's chamber are littered with traps and tests to keep the mask out of the wrong hands. The Paraka quickly face their greatest fears in the form of the mythical monster Ernak. Only Zaktan's willingness to end his own cursed existence and everyone else's lives, thereby eliminating the fear that brought Ernak to life and sustains him, allows the Paraka to pass the test and continue. In a later test, the Paraka fail due to their inability to trust one another, while they escape the resulting death trap, they end up exposed to something that begins changing them. Meanwhile, the Toa and Nika have their own tests to worry about. They soon come across a group of enemies that they had fought in their former Mataran lives, including a Raksha Tarak that had once killed Yalar during his search for the Toa of Light. Yalar is able to overcome this disturbing memory, but like all the other Anika, his powers go out of control and end up killing his opponent. Adding to their shame and grief at being killers, the bodies change to look like their old friends, the Toa Nuva. While worried that such things could happen again, they decide that the stakes are too high to abandon their quest. 
However, before the Toa Anika go on they turn to take one last look at the slain Toa Nuva, only to see that the bodies had disappeared. They then realize that the dead Toa Nuva, as well their earlier foes, were merely illusions. In their next test, the Toa Anika are trapped and told they must sacrifice one of their own to continue. With his last death still on his mind, Yalar is distracted long enough for Matoro to volunteer himself, on the grounds that he as a translator has less to offer their mission than the others and becomes another foreshadow to the Baraki story. This sacrifice is accepted and Matoro is disintegrated, only to be reformed moments later, as the willingness to die for the cause was what was important, not the death itself. After this, the Toa Anika face Umbra, a guardian of the mask who uses super speed to attack. Matoro is once again key to passing the test, as he uses his ice power to make Umbra slip and crash. As Umbra turns into a beam of light and becomes even faster, he eventually hits the ice and rebounds around the frozen cave until he is knocked out, making it easy to obtain the mask. As both groups converge on the Mask of Life, the Paraka are a little bit ahead and they set an ambush, with the Toa Anika ending up trapped and delayed. The Paraka enter the mosque's chamber to find that Vezin had arrived far ahead of all of them, and has since been fused to a Fenrak spider and to the Mask of Life itself. As the Paraka prepare to take the mask by any means necessary, Vezin uses his spear to fuse Vayok and Rydik together, ordering the resulting beast to crush the others. By the time the Anika arrive, Vayok and Rydik are back to normal and all six are knocked out. While all this is happening, Brutaka wakes up in the Paraka's stronghold under Axon's watch. While Axon extends an offer of friendship to his old partner, Brutaka rejects it and attacks. In the course of the battle, he tries to get an edge by summoning a dimensional gate to warp Axon away. Eventually, Axon accepts that Brutaka will never be redeemed, and he becomes unstoppable in his anger. Brutaka tries to get to the Paraka's antidermis, which could enhance his strength, but Axon shatters the vat before blasting Brutaka into unconsciousness. Once this is done, Botar arrives to banish Brutaka for his crimes, though Axon still expresses hope for his redemption. After all leave the stronghold, Kraka and Tatarak use Brutaka's portal to escape their exile, which began a thousand years ago in Bionicle Adventures. As the Toa Anika fight Vezin and Fenrak, the latter's ability to absorb kinetic energy is proving too much for the heroes, even when the Toa figure out how to weaken the two without hitting them, Fenrak can just tap his leg on the ground to regain his and Vezin's strength. Eventually, the Toa are able to drive Fenrak towards the chamber's lava, and Vezin surprisingly encourages him to dive in. As Yaller prepares to go after the mask, Vezin re-emerges, with his steed evolved into an even more formidable dragon called Kardas. Needing a plan of attack other than direct assault, the Toa guess that the Mask of Life may have life and thoughts of its own, and Kongu attempts to use his Mask of Telepathy to read the mosque's mind. He finds that the mask has grown to despise Vezin, and would happily abandon the madman in favor of a new, nobler guardian, Matoro. When Vezin learns of this he becomes enraged, allowing Yaller to use Axon's Zamor Sphere. The sphere freezes Vezin and Kartas in space and time, allowing the mask to be removed safely. Unfortunately, the Paraka have recovered by now, and they aren't about to let the mask go without a fight. But the mask has other plans, as Kartas makes Matoro lose his grip on it, it flies away towards the surface. As the Toa Anika are able to get a small head start following it, Vayok is dead set on refusing with Vezin, but the other Paraka smash the Spear of Fusion to ensure that Vayok will never be whole again. Back on the surface, the Mask of Life dives into the sea. Holly tries to follow it, but the depths become too deep for her to handle. As she loses consciousness, Amari Nui Mataran dives from below and helps her up to the surface, though at the cost of his own life. Before passing on, he pleads with the Toa to help a city beneath the sea. But in the midst of the Toa Anikas mourning the Mataran, they are reunited with all their friends. The Mataran had succeeded in freeing the Toa Nuva, and Axon is there as well. Botar had just left after talking to the Nuva. While the Anika worry that the Nuva will take over the mission to save the Great Spirit, the Nuva recognize that this mission is the Anika's destiny and give them their full blessing. Axon also declares his intent to be the Mataran's guardian, openly instead of secretly this time. The Paraka, watching from afar, decide that taking on twelve Toa and Axon would be suicide, opting to bide their time. 
Soon afterward, the Toa depart on their new missions which are revealed on the web, the Toa Nuva go on a mysterious quest that they have not told the Anika about, and the Toa Anika enter a secret passageway opened by Axon leading to the underwater world where the Mask of Life now resides. Topic. Plot Summary 2007. Topic. City of the Lost Far beneath the ocean surrounding Voya Nui, the sunken city of Mari Nui survives surrounded by mysterious predators. As its Mataran plan the defenses for the month, an inventor named Defilic suggests a scouting expedition to learn more about whatever is preying on Mari Nui. As he does this, the sentry Kyrex finds and claims a sinking Kanohi mask, never aware that she is being watched. By the time Kyrex brings the mask to the planning meeting, it has already been adjourned. She instead seeks out someone knowledgeable about Kanohi, but is soon caught and attacked by the very seaweed beneath her feet. She is saved from the plants by Decker, and she is happy to pass the strange mask off to him. Meanwhile, Defilic has gathered a crew for his home-built submarine, Gar, Idris, and Sarda. As they descend into unknown territory, they are soon attacked and trapped by a school of Takea sharks, who are led by a bigger, shark-like being who is named Pridak. After the submarine is destroyed, Pridak demands the mask of life from the crew and throws Sarda to the sharks when they claim ignorance. He explains that he is a Baraki, one of six warlords banished to the pit millennia ago for their crimes. Sarda is subsequently saved by the arrival of Toalasovic. The other Baraki, however, have their own plans concerning the mask. Takadox has Karapar kidnap Kyrex, and from her tale realizes that the mask is the legendary mask of life. He also sends Karapar to return Kyrex and stop Elek, who has gathered his Venom Eel army and launched an all-out assault on Mari Nui. In the meantime, Decker has found that every enemy he fights has become immortal and invincible. Realizing that his and Kyrex's strange curses come from the mask, he decides that it is too dangerous to exist. When Decker tries to destroy the mask, as the remaining two Baraki, Kalma and Mantax close in on him, it defends itself by enlarging a nearby venom eel to giant size. The eel begins to attack everything in sight. As Defilic, Gar, and Idris use the chance to escape from Pridak and his sharks, Elek and Karapar take the opportunity to snoop around Pridak's lair, where they find a newcomer to the pit, the mutated Brutaka. Takadox tries to hypnotize the eel into submission, but it becomes distracted by sounds in a long cord of stone that reaches to the surface and it knocks Takadox far away. Decker, now with a healthy respect for the mask, cautiously touches it and is given a vision of its history, along with the revelation that the pit's waters are eroding it away and damaging it. By this time, Pridak has gathered the Baraki, with Brutaka in place of the missing Takadox. As they confront Decker, Brutaka demands he hand over the mask, swearing that an order of Mata Nui member such as himself would never let the Baraki have it. When Decker refuses, saying one who should have the mask would have claimed it himself, the Baraki mock Brutaka for his lies about an order and command a giant squid to drag him off. They then step over to Decker and take the mask from him, causing it to release a blinding light. <laughs> Topic. Prisoners of the Pit Meanwhile, the Toa Anika are inside the cord locked in combat with the Ziglak. The light hits them, and they are transformed into the Toa Mari. At the same time, Decker is transformed into a duplicate of the former protector of the pit, Hydroxen. At the same time the Baraki deliver the damaged Kanohi Ignika to Nocturne to keep it safe, the Toa Mari knock the 300-foot Venom Eel unconscious, and head for Mari Nui. However, the Mataran there are frightened and uncertain about the new arrivals, and open fire on the Toa. Toa Mari Kongu then creates a gust of wind to blow Defilic out of the air bubble, while Toa Mari Holly creates a whirlpool, trapping the Mataran. Then Holly releases him, and states that if she wanted to harm him, she would have done so. Still needing to be convinced, Defilic asks five of the Toa Mari to rescue Matoro. 
Arriving at the fields, the other Toa Mari are captured by the Baraki, an attempt to lull them into a false sense of security by masquerading as Toa sent to the pit for incarceration. Matoro is captured by the newly reincarnated Hydroxen. Hydroxen takes Matoro to the pit, where he is placed under the watch of the guard robot Maxilos. Matoro's predicament worsens when he learns that Maxilos has become the new body of Teridix, the Makuta of Metru Nui. Teridix frees Matoro, forcing him to ally with him without revealing his identity to the other Toa Mari. The others, taken to prison caves by the Baraki, escape through the use of their new mask powers. Kongu summons a giant sea creature, which ends up getting into a battle with the revived 300 foot meters venom eel. All the Toa Mari then return to Mari Nui, where the others are introduced to Maxilos. Honored by Defilic by being offered the group name Toa Mari, the Six and Maxilos set out to divide the Baraki against each other. Luckily, their efforts prove successful, and the Baraki and their armies begin clashing. Afterwards, however, the Toa are shocked to learn that Mantax's army of rays is approaching Mari Nui with Holly at its head. Meanwhile, Hydroxen had just defeated Nocturne, who had been entrusted with the Ignica by Pridak. He approached the Mask of Life, conflicted as to whether take someplace secure his first instinct or destroy it, unconsciously triggered by Decker's memory. He eventually decided to destroy it and open fire. Topic. Downfall Meanwhile, as Hydroxen tries to destroy the Ignica, the mask is knocked out of the way by Holly, and Mantax quickly grabs it. After the Toa Mari reunite with Holly, they learn from Matoro that they need to destroy the stone cord linking Voya Nui and Mari Nui and save the Mataran of both islands from the resulting crash. To do so, they travel back up through the cord and hide the Mataran of Voya Nui and Mari Nui. However, they deal with the Paraka now mutated into snake-like forms, before being saved by Axon, who hides the Mataran in caverns on Voya Nui. Before the Toa Mari leave, Axon provides them with a living vehicle, the Toa Terrain Crawler, to take them back to Mari Nui. In time for the battle, Yaller burns Mantax severely, causing him to drop the mask for the Toa to retrieve it when Hydroxen interferes. Hyuki confronts and fights Gadunka, and quickly defeats him by sending volts of electricity into him. Matoro Mari soon finds Maxilos and freezes him, but is soon set free due to a blast of fire from Yaller that missed Hydroxen. Maxilos and Spinax, now a team, fights Hydroxen, while the Toa get ready to destroy the cord. Before they can, however, Gadunka returns with new allies. The 300-foot eel, and the monster Kongu summoned. After a 40-second battle with them, they destroy the cord, bringing Voya Nui crashing down onto Mari Nui, just as the Baraki come. Matoro feels the mask being pulled in the wake of Voya Nui when suddenly, every creature stops, feeling cold inside. Matoro then looks at the now grey mask, and proclaims that the Great Spirit has died. Knowing that a moment cannot be spared, Matoro leaves his fellow Mari, and quickly swims with Voya Nui to its place of origin. Meanwhile, the furious Baraki arrive, and have an all-out battle against the five remaining Mari, and plot to send their armies after Matoro. Meanwhile, Hydroxen, seeing all that has happened, discovers a destroyed Maxilos, with the spirit of Teridix missing, which will rock the foundation of the Toa's lives once they discover where he is. Matoro beats Voya Nui and descends into the universe core, nearly being crushed by the landmass above. There, the sentient Ignica speaks, and informs him to don the Mask of Life, which Matoro accepts as his destiny. The entirety of his life, from Mataran to Toa, flashes, and Matoro realizes that this was where he must be in the end. However, he used his last bit of will to save his friends. His body is then transformed into fierce raw energy, and revives the great spirit Mata Nui in a massive explosion. As the battle between the Toa Mari and the Baraki rages, a sudden change of events occurs, the Mari are instantly transported back to Metru Nui, able to breathe air, where Turaga Vakama awaits, informing them of Matoro's deed and of his death. But in their hearts, he will never be truly gone, he is now part of the universe, having transcended to a higher state of being. Meanwhile, the Toa Nuva are sent to Artaka, a paradise island, and are given new armor, masks, and weapons. Artaka then teleports the Toa Nuva to Karta Nui, telling them to fulfill their destiny and to wake Mata Nui. Topic. 
Topic: Plot Summary 2008. Note that the events of Shadows in the Sky and Swamp of Secrets both take place at the same time, with the exception of the second part of Swamp of Secrets. Topic: Shadows in the Sky. One week before the ending of Downfall, in Carta Nui, Tanma and Gavla were assigned to adjusting the Scare Rahi, apparently a scarecrow-like object used for keeping away flying Rahi from the Mataran village when Tanma noticed a large black flying creature heading for where Gavla was. When he went to help her, he discovered that she was different. She had been hit with a leech-like creature, and mutated into a monstrous form. She had become the first of the Avenue Mataran to have her light drained and become a Shadow Mataran. In the following week, Karop, the leader of the Avenue Mataran, became corrupted, along with many others. Even Radiak, hero of the Avenue Mataran, succumbed to the attack of the enemies, who Karop revealed to be members of the Brotherhood of Makuta before his corruption. All of the Avenue Mataran villages fell save one, where the remaining uncorrupted Mataran were sheltering at the time of Matanui's death. Minutes after the tragic event, Tanma noticed a white toa falling down the waterfall and there was suddenly a gigantic explosion of light, blinding the three attacking Makuta Antras, Vampra, and, Kyrix, and bringing the great spirit back to life. Likely Tanma ordered all the other Mataran to duck and close their eyes. A few hours later the Avenue Mataran waged a battle against the Makuta and the Shadow Mataran in the sky. And as they did so, the Toa Nuva arrived in Karta Nui, teleported there by Artaka from the island with the same name. As soon as the Toa Nuva arrived, Poatu rushed to engage the Makuta in battle. Wise Anua was the one that noticed that the bat-like Makuta were blind. The Toa helped the Mataran finish the fight and regrouped at the village, where they began to remember that they once lived in Karta Nui. They discovered the use of their new weapons, which they named Madak Skyblasters. Madak was the name of a strange ONU Mataran of Metru Nui who liked the light despite being able to see better in the dark, and Toa Nuvalewa had always wanted a weapon called a Skyblaster, and none of the other Toa cared to object, thus the name was created. Meanwhile, in the Makuta's Shadow Leech Hive, Mutran and Viken were working on a new experiment, a Rahi that could turn into a liquid when disturbed. Mutran kept slipping in it, and ordered Viken to get rid of it. He kicked it out of the hive and it fell into the swamp below. Viking decided not to tell Mutran that the creature doesn't fall, it flew. Vampra arrived at the hive and forced Mutran to come to the main Makuta lair to create a flying Rahi to take Viking to Destral to summon Icarix. He created a part Rahi and part Mataran creature, and sent Viking off to Destral. Back at the Avenue Mataran's village, the Toa Nuva learned of Matoro's death from the Avenue Mataran's description of the events leading up to the blinding flash of light. From this they realized that the mask of life that Matoro was last seen with was probably in the swamp below. Tahu, Gali, and Anua departed for the swamp and Lewa, Poatu, and Kapaka stayed to defend the Mataran. Tahu leading one group and Kapaka leading the other. Later, an Avenue Mataran who looked up to the Toa, named Solik, approached Kapaka and gave him part of an object called a keystone. It was a tablet detailing how to awaken Mata Nui from his endless slumber, but it had been broken into six pieces. According to Solik, the Makuta held two pieces, one held by Karap, and the locations of the other three were unknown. Kapaka, understanding all that these Mataran have been through, spoke kindly to him and gave him inspiration for the battle to come, using how Takua became a Toa as an example. It was then that Kapaka learned that Solik knew Takua. The next day, Lewa happened to knock Karap out of the sky in battle. Kapaka captured him and with Lawa's help, led him to believe the Toa would be launching an attack on the Shadow Leech Hive in a few hours. Karap found a way out and escaped to the Shadow Leech Hive, exactly as the Toa had planned. They followed him, along with Tanma, Solik, and another Avenue Mataran named Fodik. In the swamp at the bottom of Karta Nui, the Mask of Life pondered whether or not to create some more guardians for it. But recalling the failures of others like Hydroxen and the gigantic Venom Eel, it decided to create a body for itself, so it could have friends like its former guardian, Matoro. It also created itself a skyboard. 
It flew into the skies above and began silently following Kapaka and the others as the trailed Karap. He, now considering itself male, proved itself by saving the Toa from a hostile flying Rahi by speeding up its life, killing it. The Toa did not notice another flying Rahi escape through the Makuta's portal into Karta Nui, with Viken riding it, heading for Destral. When the Toa arrived in the Shadow Leech Hive, they found no leeches, and just Mutran instead. Kapaka and Solik hung back to take on Mutran, while the others headed further into the hive, which seemed to be bigger on the inside than it was in the outside. They reached a dead end, and when they turned around to see if Toa Ignika was still behind them, they found that in his place was a gigantic monster. Without worrying about whether it was hostile or not, Tanma and the others soon afterwards jumped into battle. They did not realize that this was an illusion put up by Mutran, and that this monster was actually Toa Ignika. Confused and enraged as to why the Toa were attacking him, he decided to use his life powers to kill the Toa and their Mataran friends. But eventually the illusion faded and the Toa were able to disrupt Toa Ignika's attack. Meanwhile, Mutran had attempted to tear Kapaka's mind to pieces, and Kapaka led him to believe he had succeeded, until eventually he turned the tides of the battle and froze Mutran in a blast of ice and snow. It was then that Antras, Kyrix, and Vampra arrived and quickly defeated Kapaka and captured the heroes. The Toa were chained to a wall, and the Mataran were left in another chamber. Antras warned the Toa that if they made one hostile move, he would send a mental message to Vampra and Kyrix who were with the Mataran to immediately kill them. Poatu collapsed the floor below the Makuta and used his mask of speed to race to the chamber with the Mataran before Vampra and Kyrix killed them. He returned with the Mataran, and the Makuta not far behind. Poatu shared his mask power with the others and the heroes sped around the chamber too fast to be seen and then escaped. Toa Ignika, using his life power, destroyed the organic stone cord holding the hive up and causing it to fall into the swamp. Viken arrived on Destral before long, and delivered the message to Icarix, who was now wearing Makuta Turitix's mask of shadow and sitting on his throne. Though enraged that Antras was giving him orders, Icarix decided to come and them ordered Viken to tell Antras that Icarix was not to be ordered around. By the time Icarix had arrived, the final battle had begun. The Makuta laid siege to the Mataran village, only to find that there were no Mataran there. The Toa Nuva and the Mataran were in the Makuta's base, searching for the third keystone. When the Makuta went after them, a battle occurred. In the end, Mutran used the equivalent of a Nova Blast of Shadow. Icarix had earlier sent Antras into the swamp, and Toa Ignica had made Icarix into a biomechanical being once more by de-evolving him. And after the Nova Blast, Kyrix, Vampra, and Icarix were nowhere to be found. The Toa withstood the blast, and Mutran was forced to surrender. The Toa headed into the swamp to meet up with their friends. But elsewhere, Makuta Turitix's energy floated through an unknown location. A location that would rock the Toa's universe. To discover. It was a place heavily guarded, but Turitix easily crossed, having no body and being only a cloud of energy. He located his goal, a carving of a Kanohi Hau, and set about his final goal, to accomplish his destiny. Topic. Swamp of Secrets Meanwhile, Takanuva was patrolling the beaches of Metru Nui. He begins wondering if things would have been better for Matoro and Toa Mari if he had been there. A dark thought flutters in his head for a moment, but he quickly expels it. Pushing forward with his mental energy, Takanuva picks up a picture of a dark hunter in the archives. The Toa of Light races toward the archives in ONU Metru, but he is taken by surprise at the sudden attack of a shadow leech. After a struggle to get it off, he succeeds, but not before being halfway drained of his light and knocked unconscious. Takanuva wakes up in a room in the archives where the ONU Mataran bring dead Rahi bodies for inspection. Illuminating the cave, he notices two Toa standing over him, one Toa of Water, and a Toa of Sonics. The Toa of Water calls herself Helrix, while the Toa of Sonics is Krakua. She explains that they have a message that Takanuva must deliver to the Toa Nuva. Before he leaves, though, Helrix latches her pet, Kratana onto Takanuva's Kanohi so he can learn of the past. 
Meanwhile, the other three Toa Nuva land in the Swamp of Secrets. They decide to split up, and Anua comes across a giant Nui Kopan. Slamming it with his fist, it falls into the swamp water, and emerges as a completely different looking creature with tentacles. Before it attacks, Anwa's body suddenly does not listen to his will, and he witnesses a yellow Makuta approach him. Biddle explains that his Ninra Ghost Blaster took over Anwa's mechanical parts in his body, then summons duplicates of himself, and they take Anua, who is under their control, to Krika's lair for interrogation. In another part of the swamp, Tahu encounters an enormous spherical structure embedded in a fallen stalactite. He approaches it, but is abruptly blown back by an invisible energy field, and a white makuta looms over him and prepares to feed. In Takanuva's visions of the past, he witnesses the Toa Mata being awoken and spoken to by Helrix. After questions are exchanged and hot arguments are quelled, they are led outside of the room they are in, only to be taught more about what Toa are meant to do in their life. Back in the swamp, Biddle had arrived at Krika's cave. Anua silently realizes that he is no longer under control by Biddle, and quickly gets one duplicate into a headlock. Threatening to tear the Makuta's head off, the other Biddles blast him with energy. Anua rises to see fifty Biddles before him, and he then makes the earth explode beneath them. His concentration broke, only one Biddle pursues the escaping Anua, who uses his Ninra Ghost Blaster to create an energy field around Biddle, sending him falling down to the swamp. In yet another part of the swamp, Gali finds a broken keystone in the grasp of a sentient plant. After successfully retrieving it, she is attacked by Gorast, who stuns her. After a short, furious fight, Gali traps Gorast in a mud sinkhole. Gorast seemingly commits suicide by drowning herself, but she shortly bursts from the ground and defeats Gali. A huge fireball then illuminates the sky. Tahu struggles getting up and then rolls away from Krika's grasp. Krika then explains to Tahu why Makuta hate Toa so much, and that is why he must die. Tahu then succumbs to a sudden cold that sweeps over him, and with one final effort, launches an enormous fireball into the sky. Back in Takanuva's visions, Gali is knocked flat by her trainer, Hydroxen, after being defeated countless times before. She then goes into a short frenzy in a wild effort to defeat him, but fails. She gets up, ready to strike again, but then is knocked down by Spinax. She then finds her way back to the Toa Mata's rest station, and engages in discussion with several of the other Toa. In the present, right before feeding on Gali's light, Gorast is picked up by Anua and slammed into the ground so hard she almost snaps into pieces. Gali turns out to be all right, and Anua and her escape, Gorast and Biddle wildly on their tails. They eventually arrive at the scene of Tahu's dismay, and a short battle ensues. Kyrix, another Makuta, is seen falling out of the sky, and the other three rush to help him, leaving the three Toa Nuva alone. They are guided deeper in the swamp by an Avenue Matarin who had appeared to help them escape. They eventually arrive at a small ground surrounded by light vines. The Nuva are horrified by what they see in the middle, matarin like forms are undergoing strange changes. Suddenly, the forms change into Borok, leaving the Toa puzzled. The Avenue Matarin explains that the first Borok had evolved from Avenue Matarin, and the transformations came naturally. Gali takes her eyes off of the robots for a moment, and when she looks back, they are gone. The Matarin guide hands Anua a keystone, and then lies down and transforms into a Borok, and disappears like his other brothers. Tahu then expresses his subtle rage toward the fact that that was the price to be paid for Mata Nui's awakening. In Takanuva's visions, he sees Lewa underwater, attempting to find his Miru. Frustrated from the attacks of carnivorous schools of fish, he gives up, and Hydroxen laughs at him. Their trainer had taken each of their masks and hidden it somewhere on Daxia. Angered, Lewa comments on how each of the other Toa Mata are doing, then realizes that they can work together. Hydroxen commends him, and Lewa seeks out Gali's help for getting his mask, in exchange for him getting her mask. After the mask search, Tahu and Kapaka scale a mountain to get to an order of Mata Nui base. They then trick the guards into letting them in, and they are greeted by Helrix, the leader of the order. She stops working on her project, the Swamp Strider, and then asks them if they will take on the job to become Mata Nui's guardians. In the present, Tahu and the two other Toa follow a trail created by the Makuta toward Krika's base. 
they plan a strategy to steal the final keystone. Once arriving there, they cause timed explosions of their elements to happen. Each explosion goes right, and each Makuta is distracted out of the lair. Seizing the opportunity, the Toa steal the keystone, and Tahu throws a shield around them from the attack of the non-tricker Krika. Anua digs a huge hole and the Nuva follow it, planning to escape to the Kadrex, where they will wait for the other three Toa. Krika and his team follow, planning to ambush the Toa. It turns out the Nuva were the ones planning the ambush. Above the Kadrex, they witness the three Makuta and three more Bittles appear, waiting for them. Tahu then lead the two other Nuva in a power dive towards the Makuta in a last attempt to defeat them. In Takanuva's visions, he witnesses the Toa Mata in Karta Nui, and Kapaka and Tahu fighting off a group of Avoka. After they are defeated, Tahu and Kapaka debate whether or not they should tell the other Mata the truth about the Kadrex and what it is meant for. Back in the present, a furious battle breaks out against the two teams in the swamp. Eventually, the Toa gain the upper hand, but not before Antras and his Makuta team come flying down, and prepare to fire at the Nuva. All hope seems lost, when suddenly, an ice blast blocks the blast of energy Antras fires, backfiring on him. Kapaka, the three Avenue Madarin, and the other two Toa soar down, ready to join the fight. Tahu and his team smile as they charge back into the fight, ready for the final battle. In Takanuva's last vision, Gali defeats the last Avoka. While Tahu and Kapaka congratulate the team, the final Avenue Madarin, Takua, leaves Karta Nui with his friends. While they did that, Tahu and Kapaka led their team to the Kadrex. Curious as to what it is, Lewa runs to it, only to be blasted away by the energy field. They insert the keystone into a niche inside the Kadrex's energy field, and enter it. Tahu then closes the entrance, and the Mata witness a huge energy storm brewing inside Karta Nui. Tahu explains what their destinies are, and the other four Toa Mata are outraged by Kapaka and the Toa of Fire for not telling them. Tahu also explains that if they don't get into the six canisters lined up in the Kadrex, the storm would kill them all. The team reluctantly enters their canisters, ready for the day that they must awaken. The Kratana is forcefully ripped off of Takanuva's face, and the Toa of Light then asks how he will go to Karta Nui soon enough. At that moment, Brutaka enters the room, holding the Dark Hunter Dweller in his hands. He then activates his damaged Almac, and Takanuva steps through the portal, ready to begin his trip to Karta Nui. Topic. Journey of Takanuva Note that this story, along with the Kingdom and Dark Mirror, all take place between the ending of Swamp of Secrets, and the beginning of the final battle. After passing through the portal made by Brutaka, Takanuva soon exits through another portal and falls out of the sky, and into a different, pocket dimension, which is the city of Silver Pocket Dimension. He had ended up here, because Brutaka's mask of dimensional gates was damaged, thus causing its power to malfunction, which resulted in Takanuva to wind up in the wrong place. When Takanuva lands, he finds himself in a dark forest, and soon comes across the spectral mask. At first, Takanuva believes he is hallucinating, as masks normally do not talk. His thoughts, however, do not seem to be acknowledged by the mask, who talks about its relief of Takanuva's arrival and informs Takanuva of trouble in a nearby village. Without hearing what caused the trouble, Takanuva quickly walks off to help the village. When Takanuva arrives at the village, he sees a large group of Kestora fighting against a large, monster-like creature, city-building creature. Thinking that the creature is the source of the commotion and trouble, Takanuva quickly assaults the creature and drives it off. Turning back to the Kestoras, he expects applause and thanks, but instead, he finds himself being laughed at and locked out of the village. Distressed, Takanuva goes back into the forest and finds the mask. He informs it of what happened, and the mask, shocked, tells him that the members of the creature's species are actually the peaceful inhabitants of the village, and they had been driven out of their city by the Kestoras. It also informs Takanuva that the one he fought off was the last one residing in the village. Takanuva, quickly noting his mistake, runs off to find the creature and apologize. He succeeds, and together they hatch a plan to steal back the city. At night, Takanuva stations himself outside the village and shoots fireworks into the sky. 
The Kestoras quickly swarm out of the village, and watch the fireworks in fascination. While they watch and enjoy themselves, the creature burrows back to the city and seals the gates, locking the Kestoras out and reclaiming the village. Having finally accomplished his task, Takanuva goes back to the mask, who congratulates him and opens a portal. Takanuva enters it, and is transported once more into another dimensional voyage in the Kingdom Alternate Universe, which is told in the Kingdom short story. The events of the final journey of Takanuva, including how he got to Karta Nui, are told in the Dark Mirror short story. Topic. The final battle The fight between the Toa Nuva and the blind and mutated Makuta rages on in the swamp. Krika deals a heavy blow that stuns Gali, and he carries her deeper into the swamp. While there, Krika claims that if the Toa awaken Mata Nui, a horrible future will come to pass, so Gali must leave to prevent that. No sooner than when those words left the Makuta's mouth, a powerful blast of light flew across Krika's face. He looked skyward to find the worst fear of the Brotherhood of Makuta, Takanuva, the legendary Toa of Light, with his power lance still aimed at the Makuta, ready to destroy his armor. Krika retreated into the swamp. Gali, confused at the Toa's transformation, wanted answers, only to be told to wait until the Toa were assembled. Poatu arrived shortly after and remarked on Takanuva's new coloration. When the trio arrived at the Kadrex, there was a great battle between the Toa and Makuta. Fortunately, Takanuva arrived from the space between dimensions, using the deceased Dark Mirror's dimensions Brutaka's mask of dimensional gates, and manages to drive off the Makuta Krika, who was menacing Gali, with his power lance. As soon as the Toa were reassembled, Ignika, now able to speak, arrived. Ignika quickly reported that he was on a countdown to the elimination of everything in the universe. He told of how he was forged, and that the great beings intended him as a failsafe if the universe ever went wrong. Takanuva then reported that when the Toa reawaken Mata Nui, a massive energy storm will erupt in Karta Nui, and destroy everyone and everything in the cavern. No sooner than when he finished the report, the Makuta returned, and a massive battle erupted once more. The Toa rushed to fit the keystones they retrieved into the Kadrex. With the energy field down, they entered the complex, unaware that Antras was silently following them. Before the other Makuta could get in, Tahu retrieved the keystones to raise the energy field once more. Inside the Kadrex, the Toa Nuva discovered niches in the floor, similar in size and shape to the canisters that they used to make their way to the island of Mata Nui. Anua hit a button on a nearby console, and the floor slid down to a cavern far below. The niches were then replaced by large light stones, and three metal cocoons erupted from the floor. The cocoons then disappeared, leaving behind three vehicles. Then Antras sprang from the shadows into the cockpit of one of the ships, the Jetrax T-6. His mind merged with the ship, allowing him to see through the ship's sensors. Lewa and Poatu both jumped aboard the Axelara T-9 and Rako T-3, and pursued Antras out of the Kadrex. Outside the Kadrex, Takanuva meets up with Tanma and Fodik, and they dragged Radiak into the swamp, unaware that they are being followed by Karop, Kyrix, and Biddle, with his past selves. Vampra, Gavla and Gorast had gone to track down Icarix, as had Tahu, Solik and Ignika, and Krika and Mutran had vanished. Mutran's assistant, the Shadow Mataran Viking, meets Takanuva, Fodik, Radiak and Tanma. He reports that the scream of a clack shattered the hold Shadow had over him, and he no longer served the Makuta. Takanuva, seeing the truth in his eyes, began search for the clack. Ironically, Radiak was the one to find the creature. He attacked the Rahi, intent on destroying it, but the Seacher's cry broke the Shadow spell. Although Radiak's mental state was restored, his armor, mask, and elemental ability remained as when he was fully in Shadow. Radiak then reported the Makuta actually wanted Mata Nui to awaken for reasons he did not know. Takanuva ordered the four Mataran to leave Karta Nui before the energy storm erupted, but as they left, Takanuva was attacked by Kyrix, Karap, and seven incarnations of Biddle. Under the sway of Shadow, he lost control to rage and started attacking them all, taunting them that their greatest wish, a Toa of Shadow, was now in existence and they could choke on the knowledge he was not theirs, and declaring that this battle would not be a Kohli masquerade, that any Makuta that got near him would die. 
He blasted a hole in Kyrex's armor and charged into the midst of the Makuta, never noticing one of the Biddles was about to strike him down. Meanwhile, Antras fought Poatu, Lewa and Kapaka in a battle on board vehicles. Meanwhile, Takanuva was locked in combat with Kyrex and Biddle. A bolt of light fired by Kapaka aboard the Jetrax stunned Biddle, causing him to lose focus on his mask and the time clones created by his mask to disappear. Before Takanuva could destroy Kyrex though, Kapaka brought him to his senses, allowing the Makuta to flee. Takanuva reported to Kapaka what he had learned from Radiac, and Kapaka left aboard the Jetrax to warn the other Toa Nuva. Takanuva resumed his search for Madarin and came across Gavla. He managed to put himself and the Madarin in the path of the Clax Scream, and the mental shadow dissolved in both of them. Takanuva told Gavla to leave, for her to join the other Madarin. Icarix and Krika try to sabotage the plan, by destroying the Kodrex. Because of this, Gorast and Vampra convinced Icarix to teleport, by telling him the plan is working. Fueled by his desires for the plan to fail so he can take over the world, he falls for the trick. Then Gorast disrupts his teleportation power making parts of him scatter all over the universe. Krika escapes for now. The Toa Nuva reveal that the lightstones that come up from the canister's resting spot are the key to awaking Mata Nui, they figure out that Ignika could awaken the Great Spirit by removing his mask and placing it in the center of the Kodrex. However, in doing so Ignika would have to sacrifice his life as a Toa, something he has vowed never to do, and he tries to destroy them when he hears the news. However, when Matoro and how he gave his life to save the entire universe is mentioned, Ignika finally decides to sacrifice himself. Outside the Kodrex, Tahu and Gorast are fighting. Krika comes to warn Gorast that an energy storm will kill them all, but she is so bent on killing him for trying to ruin the plan, she doesn't listen. She disrupts his power to turn intangible, and he becomes nothing. Just then, the energy storm began. As Takanuva flew to the western portal, he noticed Mutran attempting to control the storm. His life was ended as the energy incinerated his armor and his essence. Takanuva, without regret for not trying to save the Makuta, flew away to join the Toa Nuva. Meanwhile, Gorast could only stare at the storm, shocked by the betrayal of her idol. Antras tries to convince all the Makuta that they must try to escape, but Biddle tries to abandon his fellow Makuta. He fails, and all of the remaining Makuta are killed. The Toa Nuva and Takanuva use the vehicles to escape Karta Nui. Back in Metru Nui, celebrations have begun. But just as Turaga Doom finished his victory speech, a shadow fell across the land, and the stars align into the Kanohi Krakon, Great Mask of Shadows. Turidix announces that when Mata Nui awakened, Turidix slipped into the Great Spirit's mind, possessing his body and banishing Mata Nui's mind into the Mask of Life, the only thing to escape the storm, teleported away to safety. Turidix tells the Toa that he has also banished the Mask from the universe. He now is the Mataran universe, and the Toa have no hope of defeating him. The book ends with the Mask of Life turning back to gold, and hurtling through the Bionicle Galaxy, the space between the universes. Within the mask, the voice of the Great Spirit vows, I will return, as the mask of life reaches a mysterious planet. <laughs> Topic. Super chapter books Topic. Raid on Vulcanus 2009. The book begins with Pharaoh and Skirmix searching for prey out in the desert. Pharaoh is about to leave when Skirmix indicates there is prey around. Pharaoh spots a caravan, protected by JLU, heading toward Tajan, and decides to pursue. JLU reflects how the Skrull have slowly become more and more aggressive, finally attacking a tarot. JLU Sand Stalker rears at the site of a destroyed caravan, the site of a Bone Hunter raid. JLU tells the Agori he is escorting that it is nothing to worry about. He then spots a bone hunter riding towards him and orders the Agori to flee and hide in a sandstorm. JLU rides up to meet Pharaoh, and the two engage in battle. The Ice Tribe Glatorian is able to knock Pharaoh off of his steed, but the bone hunter quickly recovers and aims his Thornix launcher at JLU, ordering him to get off his sand stalker and toss his Thornix launcher away. 
the Glatorian does so, and, after a brief sword fight, Jelu gains the upper hand and defeats Pharaoh, discovering a map of modern Vulcanus in the Bone Hunter's possession. Jelu asks what it is, but Pharaoh refuses to talk, even when the Glatorian threatens to kill Skirmix. Jelu leaves and catches up with the caravan, which had been raided by Zesk. Once the group resumes its journey, Jelu studies the map and realizes that it details the defenses of Vulcanus, even ones that were not there even a week ago, and that the map is not written in the Bone Hunter's language, but instead Agori. When Jelu and the Agori reach Tajan, the Glatorian meets up with Metis, who talks about Tajan and its Glatorian, and asks Jelu if he would be interested in fighting for the village. When Jelu declines, Metis says that he is on his way to Vulcanus with Gresh to fight against Acker, and Jelu decides to travel to Vulcanus with them. Along the way, the group runs into a caravan with a broken wheel. The Agori in the caravan are somewhat biased against Jelu, as a Glatorian of the Ice Tribe offered to help them earlier in exchange for half of their goods, due to the path ahead being filled with Vorix. Gresh offers to repair their wheel and escort them for free, much to objections of Metis. After the caravan is fixed, Gresh says that they should keep traveling despite it being nighttime, reasoning that they have a better chance of surviving a Vorix attack if they are moving rather than if they make camp. As they travel through the desert, they notice a Vorix about to attack them, and Jelu defeats it with a Thornix. A multitude of Vorix then begin to attack the two Glatorian, who are able to fend most of them off. When the Vorix become too much to handle, Jelu and Gresh decide to toss two pieces of new armor from the caravan in opposite directions, resulting in the Vorix fighting each other for the cargo, and the group is able to make it out of the pass safely. As they near Vulcanus, Jelu compliments Gresh on his fighting. After they reach their destination, the Agori apologize for judging the Glatorian so harshly, but Metis sends Gresh and Jelu off, stating that they are supposed to accept pay for helping. The two Glatorian eventually make it to the village in a Vulcanus, where they talk about being a Glatorian and about the core war. Jelu then spots Ra'anu, and excuses himself. The Ice Glatorian tells Ra'anu about the map, and they discuss the chances of survival against a Bone Hunter attack. Ra'anu suggests fleeing, but Jelu instead suggests assembling a group of Glatorian to defend the village. Ra'anu asks Jelu if he is going to lead the Glatorian, but Acker, having overheard the conversation, says he will do it instead. The Fire Glatorian looks over the map and questions Jelu's idea, saying that Bone Hunters can cause great destruction. When Ra'anu asks if Acker is saying they should flee, the Glatorian responds by saying that Jelu's plan is most likely the best choice. Gresh declares that he supports it, and Acker orders him to go to Tassara and recruit some Glatorian. He also sends out two Glatorian trainees to Tajan to seek help there, and Jelu stays with Acker. Acker instructs Ra'anu what to do if the Bone Hunters attack the village while the Glatorian are gone, then leaves with Jelu. The two Glatorian ride into the north, where Acker explains he has to pick up a friend to aid in an attack on the Bone Hunter camp. Meanwhile, Gresh rides to Tassara, and on his way, he ponders the Skrall and Bone Hunters, and what they could do if they allied with each other. Elsewhere, Pharaoh and four other Bone Hunters hear the two rookie Glatorian from Vulcanus. Pharaoh orders the group to split up into two groups, planning to ambush and kill the Glatorian. Acker and Jelu cut to the west across the bed of the Skrall River, where Jelu notices telltale marks of Vorix in the sand. Acker tells Jelu that they are heading for a cave inside a small mountain range when they are suddenly ambushed by Zesk and Vorix. Jelu reaches for his Thornix launcher, but the fire Glatorian stops him. Acker calls for Malum, who is hiding in the cave. At hearing this, the Vorix begin murmuring among themselves. Acker calls again, and Malum comes out of his cave. He asks the two Glatorian why they have come, and Acker tells Malum that Vulcanus is in trouble. Malum refuses to help until Acker reveals that the Bone Hunters are involved. Acker then explains the situation, and Malum agrees to help. In Tassara, Gresh goes to the arena, where Vastus is in a practice session. Vastus asks if Gresh's match was cancelled, and Gresh tells Vastus the situation. Vastus refuses to help, saying that it could be a trick by the Bone Hunters, and states that he will not leave Tassara. Angered, Gresh leaves. 
Elsewhere, Kiina and Tarek scan the wastelands to investigate rumors of a herd of wild rock steeds. They instead find the bodies of the two rookie Glatorian sent from Vulcanus and a bone hunter sword buried in the sand nearby. Kiina offers to go to Vulcanus to tell them about the deaths of the Glatorian trainees, and Tarek says he will bury the two at Tajan. Meanwhile, Acker, JLU, and Malam go to the Bone Hunter camp, and at Malam's order, the Vorix attack and ambush the Bone Hunters. At first, the Vorix and Glatorian are able to defeat many Bone Hunters, but in the middle of the battle, one of them throws something on the fire and causes it to explode into a much larger blaze. The Bone Hunters gain the upper hand and manage to take down many Vorix, and the remaining Vorix, along with the Glatorian, retreat. They return to the cave, and Acker asks if Malum could defend Vulcanus. He refuses, but wishes the two luck in the battle to come. In Vulcanus, Ra'anu watches the Agori villagers work on the village defenses when Kiina arrives, telling Ra'anu about the deaths of the Glatorian trainees. Ra'anu then explains the situation to Kiina, and she tells Ra'anu to flee. Ra'anu objects to this, and the two argue. As they argue, they are interrupted by JLU and Acker. JLU tells Ra'anu about the attack on the Bone Hunter camp while Acker greets Kiina. Kiina asks Acker why he is encouraging the village to fight the Bone Hunters, and Acker responds by asking what the village would do when the Skrull come. JLU then suggests adding on to the village's defenses. Hours pass as the villagers add on to the defenses of the village, and eventually Kiina joins in. A few Glatorian, including Gresh, Strack, and a few apprentices from Tassara arrive at Vulcanus. JLU asks how Gresh got Strack to join, and Gresh tells JLU that he lied, and told Strack that there was a large Exidian payment. Gresh then explains to the other Glatorian that he met up with an Agori on the way back to Vulcanus, and the Agori told him that the Skrall informed him that the Bone Hunters would be attacking from the east, from the treacherous Iron Canyon. Ra'anu tells Acker that they must build walls along the canyon rim, but Acker refuses, and Kiina agrees, saying that they should trick the hunters. Meanwhile, Pharaoh and his comrades ride through the wastelands to Vulcanus. One young bone hunter objects to the raid, and in response, Pharaoh kills him. He asks if any other bone hunters have anything to say, and when no one answers, unwilling to be killed, the hunters ride on. Elsewhere, in Roxtus, Tuma thinks about the past few weeks, such as an Agori betraying his kind, and supplying information to the Skrall. Stronius then comes in and asks why Tuma supplied information to Vulcanus. Tuma tells Stronius that it is a test for the Bone Hunters, and he wished to make the test harder for them. At Vulcanus, Kiina teaches an Agori how to use a Thornix launcher with a rock in place of the Thornix, with no success. Kiina tells the Agori to go to Gresh, who is teaching the Agori how to cut fireroot vines for a trap. Metis, one of Gresh's Agori, tries to cut it, but gets his knife stuck in the vine. Ra'anu cuts the vine easily, and Metis says he would rather go to JLU or Strack, when he realizes Strack is gone. Later JLU makes a trap to be used on the Bone Hunters. When the alert is set off that the Bone Hunters have arrived, JLU sets off the trap, killing and wounding several Bone Hunters. After losing some of his group, Pharaoh decides to turn back and return to the desert. Upon hearing of the Bone Hunters' retreat, Ra'anu dismisses the Glatorian, despite Kiina's warnings. Kairi spots something in the desert, and upon realizing that it's Bone Hunters, attempts to warn Ra'anu, but is knocked unconscious. The Bone Hunters attack Vulcanus, and despite the assistance of Acker, is badly outmatched. The other Glatorian return, this time with Tarix, Vastus, and several trainees. The Glatorian are able to defend the village from the Bone Hunters, and drive Pharaoh, the last remaining hunter, away. Topic. The Legend Reborn 2009. The book begins with the Kanohi Ignica flying through space, launched from the moon Aqua Magna, containing the mind and spirit of Mata Nui, after his gigantic robot body was stolen by Teridix, right after the events of Bionicle Legends No. 11, The Final Battle. The former Great Spirit vows to save his people, even as the mask is caught by the nearby Bara Magna's gravity. 
The Ignica lands in the desert, creating a large crater, which attracts the attention of several scarabax beetles, including Click. It then rises in the air and uses its power to create a body for its host, which scares most of the beetles away, except for Click. Mata Nui quickly befriends a remaining scarabax beetle, Click, who was not yet named, which touches the mask of life, and is transformed into a shield. Mata Nui immediately puts it to use defending himself, as a Vorix attacks him, which retreats after its tail breaks, from the impact of striking Mata Nui's shield very hard. The shield transforms back into a beetle, and Mata Nui picks up the tail, as a Thornatus reaches the scene, driven by Metis. The Agori agrees to take Mata Nui to Vulcanus, where he has some business. The two arrive in time to watch an arena match between Acker and Strack. The veteran overcomes the Ice Tribe warrior, but after surrendering Strack attacks Acker from behind by throwing his shield towards Acker. Mata Nui saves the Vulcanus Glatorian, managing to defeat Strack, when the Vorix stinger tail he carries transforms into a sword, after touching the mask. Acker takes Mata Nui to his hut. Metis arrives and offers Mata Nui the chance to become a Glatorian, but Mata Nui refuses. While he is speaking with Acker about his mission, Kiina jumps out of hiding. After noticing Mata Nui's scarabax and calling it Click jokingly, Mata Nui accepts the name. She, having heard him speak of his mission, offers to show Mata Nui a cavern full of ancient technology in Tajan he can use, in exchange for him taking her along on his journey. On the next day, the three leave for Tajan on Kiina's Thornatus. While traveling through Sandre Canyon, they discuss the possibility of there being a traitor among the Agori. However, the Scopio XV-1 vehicle, piloted by Tellurus, a feared and vicious Glatorian, who works with the Skrall, suddenly emerges from the ground in front of them, and bone hunters, sent after the group by the Agori traitor, appear behind them. At first put at a disadvantage, they manage to escape when Mata Nui creates an avalanche, which buries Telorus's Scopio XV-1 and all of the bandits, killing the pack of bone hunters. With Telurus knocked unconscious, they confiscate his vehicle, and imprison him. Upon reaching Tajan, the Mata Nui and Glatorian find it burning, and destroyed. Inside the destroyed village, the group finds Gresh, badly wounded. They head for Kiina's cave, and while doing so, they see Tuma leading Skrall and Bone Hunters and realize they have joined forces. In Kiina's cave, they find Barracks, with whom Kiina becomes annoyed for trespassing, being possessive of the cavern. Mata Nui and Acker manage, though, to convince her to let him treat Gresh, despite her heavily negative opinion about the particular Agori. Meanwhile, Mata Nui is attracted by the inscriptions and symbols on the cavern wall, finding them familiar. Kiina negatively theorizes that it must have been built by the great beings, startling Mata Nui. He finds a great door marked with a familiar symbol. The Ignica opens it and inside Mata Nui finds the designs of his old robot body. In Roxtus, Tuma gloats over his success in destroying Bara Magna's main water source, which he believes will make the other villages fight against each other for the precious substance. Meanwhile, back in Tajan, Acker knocks out a pair of bone hunter guards, clearing the way for the others to come out. Seeing their weapons sorry state, Acker requests Mata Nui to use the Ignica's power to repair them. Mata Nui does so with Acker's sword, granting him fire abilities. Taking Kiina's staff next, Mata Nui states he will then resume his own quest, but is persuaded by his newfound friends to remain. He then transforms Gresh's blades next. The group then travels to Tassara, and along the way, the Glatorian practice with their new elemental powers and Acker starts teaching Mata Nui fighting techniques. Arriving in Tassara, they find a match between Vastus and Tarix taking place, with Metis and Ra'anu overseeing it. Acker speaks to the crowd against the Glatorian system and is supported by Vastus and Tarix. The Skrall Bone Hunter Alliance and the destruction of Tajan is announced and Acker calls for unity. Ra'anu states they cannot fight the Skrall, but at Acker's request, Mata Nui demonstrates the mosque's ability to transform Glatorian weapons, and made an example with Tarix's water blades. Ra'anu gets Mata Nui and the Glatorian to swear allegiance to the Agori and they all celebrate their new unity. Defenses are immediately built in Tassara. Meanwhile, Kiina corners Barracks in the hot springs and accuses him of being the traitor, but the two are then captured by the real traitor along with some Skrall and Bone Hunters. 
Metis and Ra'anu run to the village to announce their capture and Mata Nui resolves to go rescue them, alone. Before leaving, he assists in the uniting of the two metal shelters of the village, and realizes something, though he does not share his realization with Acker. Caged in Roxtus, Kiina and Barracks are clashing over the cavern. Eventually, the two realize they were both seeking to hide from the outside world in there and agree to share the place. Meanwhile, Mata Nui reaches Roxtus, and challenges Tuma in a duel for his friend's freedom. They both battle fiercely, but Tuma gains the upper hand. Suddenly Mata Nui remembers Akar's training and finds a wound in Tuma's back, which had been caused by a Batera a few weeks earlier. Using it against him, he slips under the Skrall leader's guard, and strikes three times, which causes Tuma to faint, who was unable to bear the pain of his reopened wound. Mata Nui waits for the Skrall to honor his deal with Tuma. But then Metis appears, revealing himself to be the traitor, and orders the Skrall and the Bone Hunters to kill Mata Nui. The former Great Spirit makes Click escape, but the Scarabax returns along with hundreds of its kin, which gather in a huge form resembling Malum, which temporarily scares the Skrall and Bone Hunters. Mata Nui frees Kiina and Barracks, even as the Glatorian and Agori arrive to fight the Skrall and the Bone Hunters, and Click rejoins Mata Nui. Tuma, even though he is imprisoned, manages to escape into the desert, along with Tellurus, who has regained possession of the ruined Scopio XV-1. As Tuma escapes, his bodyguard, Stronius temporarily takes control of the United Skrall army, in Tuma's absence. A great battle ensues, but despite the initial surprise, the enemies regroup and start defeating the Glatorian. After fighting Mata Nui briefly, Pharaoh, the Bone Hunter leader, leaves the battle, expecting the Skrall to lose. Mata Nui manages to open a gap in their lines and spots Metis fleeing. He pursues, defeating the Agori's guards, and reaches Metis's Thornatus which is then flipped over by some Vorix. Mata Nui transforms the traitor into a snake through usage of the Ignica and returns to his friends. Meanwhile, Acker, Gresh and Kiina, cornered by the Skrall, attempt to combine their powers but are unable to repel the assault. Mata Nui adds life energy to their attack, increasing the intensity sufficiently to drive the Skrall, and the Bone Hunters back, leaving the Glatorian victorious, even as their enemies scattered and retreated into the wilderness. Weeks later, Mata Nui witnesses the uniting of the metallic shelters of the villages to protect the new mega-city. As the process is completed, Mata Nui's, and his friends recognize the structure's resemblance to the shape of the mechanical being Mata Nui's original body, seen in the cavern. Barracks shows Mata Nui a coin he found in the cavern, with the shape of the robot on one side, and the pattern of a scrawl shield on the other. Mata Nui resolves to discover its meaning, which is a map of the Valley of the Maze. Mata Nui, accompanied by Kiina, Gresh, Acker and Barracks, serving as chronicler, leaves on a journey north of the Black Spike Mountains, to head to the Valley of the Maze, in hopes of finding a way to regain his original body from Turidix. They will challenge many enemies, including the shapeshifting Batera, who plagued, and nearly wiped out the Skrall. They will also have to deal with and surviving Skrull, Bone Hunters, and other threats. But, despite knowing he will soon have to fight alone, once he meets Turidix again, Mata Nui realizes his friends have taught him more than he ever learned by himself, in his long existence. Topic. Journey's End 2010. Topic. Prologue Angon stands in his chamber, reflecting lamentingly on the beauty of Spheris Magna and its past. He dwells on the great being's ability to create and study, but not to lead and govern, and then the element lords and their failure in leading the Agori. The great being then walks out of his room and leaves the fortress, glancing up at the giant robot before him, the last hope for Spheris Magna. He decides to name the robot. Mata Nui, which is the word for Great Spirit in the Mataran language. Topic. Chapter 1 With information from the Agori Barracks and Crotesius, Mata Nui has found the center of the vast valley of the maze, but cannot locate an entrance to the chamber within. Upon voicing his frustrations aloud, a recording asks him three questions which he realizes are a riddle. 
After hours of reflection, Mata Nui comes to realize that the solution to the riddle is the three virtues that the great beings had instilled in him, for they too had made the chamber. An opening is created, and Mata Nui enters down a stairway to a wide pool of lava. Immediately, he notices the Agori Tarduk suspended above the lava. At the mega village, Kiina and Akur express worry about Mata Nui's long absence and finally agree to go search for their friend. Topic. Chapter 2 Mata Nui rescues Tarduk, but even as he does the tower begins to crumble and fall apart. Mata Nui and Tarduk flee, and once out of the building, turn to see a volcano emerging from the ground under it. Mata Nui realizes it is not a natural volcano and, by digging through the rock, finds a metal hatch and enters it, finding himself inside a mechanism created by the great beings. He climbs through it, eventually reaching an open space where he finds the designs of his original body, along with a screen which recounts the tale of his origin and makes him remember his original mission, to pull together the fragments of Spherus Magna. He also finds out the great beings had planned to build a second robot, to help him with the task, but were unable to do so. Mata Nui begins to despair, but Tarduk arrives and, learning of this, helps him realize that he can use the broken robot to achieve the same result, and the two agree to search for a second power source that the great beings likely built for their planned robot. Topic. Chapter 3 Now returned to the Agori village, Mata Nui asks Ra'anu if he can occupy the robot, which Ra'anu flatly refuses. Akur, in light of Mata Nui's role against the Skrall, persuades him to listen, and shows Ra'anu the real shape of the village. However, Ra'anu continues to refuse due to concern for the safety of the Agori, despite Mata Nui's pleas. Later, Mata Nui talks with Akur and Gresh, explaining Makuta Teritix's ambition of conquest and power, which Mata Nui once wielded. While Akur trusts Mata Nui completely, Gresh is shocked about Mata Nui's true nature and fears he may use the power of his old body to rule them. Mata Nui counters Gresh calmly, stating that, if Gresh does believe he is a threat, he is more than welcome to imprison him, which Gresh cannot bring himself to do. Meanwhile, Ra'anu reflects upon his past, the time when during the Core War he served the great beings and witnessed the construction of Mata Nui's original body. Finally, pondering over recent events and the decision at hand, he decides to seek out Mata Nui and discuss it with him. After the Agori leader questions Mata Nui's need, the former great spirit senses the Makuta's approach in order to kill him and informs Ra'anu of this, and that the only way he can stop him is to fight him. Faced with what Mata Nui has said, Ra'anu finally agrees, but warns Mata Nui against betraying them. Topic. Chapter 4 Teritix flies through space, reflecting on the Makuta's desire for the respect of the Mataran, his struggle to take over the Mataran universe, and his discovery of Mata Nui's survival. He accelerates toward Bara Magna, eager to eliminate Mata Nui and use Bara Magna as a base for his universal conquest. Meanwhile, inside the Mataran universe, Tahu, regarding their situation with annoyance, has just tried to ambush a group of Raksha with Anua, but the Raksha reversed their direction before the trap could be sprung. A flying member of the Order of Mata Nui arrives and announces the Raksha have gathered south. Tahu orders her to find as many Toa as she can to pursue the Raksha. Meanwhile, Nektan, on Zakas, remembers the Skakti history and how he allied with Teritix as they prepare to travel south. <laughs> Topic. Chapter 5 Mata Nui stands in the head of the prototype robot with a box containing the power source required to energize the robot. Kiina questions him about his decision to use the robot and the impact it would have. Mata Nui reassures her and hands click to her for safety, appreciating the friendship given to him by Kiina and the other Glatorian, to her emotional response. At his request, Kiina leaves to join the others in the desert. Inside the robot, Mata Nui powers it up, fearing an explosion similar to the one that scattered it 150,000 years ago. 
none occurring, he removes the ignica, allowing his body to disintegrate and beginning to focus on shifting his mind into the robot's body, successfully entering it after some struggle. In the desert, the Glatorian and Agori witness in awe and disbelief the robot being powered up and animated as Mata Nui rises in his new body. Acker draws his attention using his fire powers, speaking with Mata Nui who sends them to take shelter while he begins his attempt to repair the shattering, watching them go and requesting the Vorix, Bone Hunters and Skrull to take cover likewise, to the acquiescence of the first and suspicion of the other two. Mata Nui then releases gravitic energy aimed at Boda Magna and Aqua Magna. However, just as the beams of energy strike the targets, Teridix arrives, eclipsing the sun and striking Bara Magna, creating a gigantic crater and earthquakes. Topic. Chapter 6 As Kiina and Gresh look at the two robots confronting each other, Gresh suggests going out to help Mata Nui, but Kiina tells him to make a plan first. Meanwhile, Mata Nui attempts to convince Teridix not to fight, but Makuta instead tries to persuade the Great Spirit to join him. Mata Nui reveals their destiny to remake Spheris Magna, but his opponent does not accept it. He asks Mata Nui the reason for his fighting and is surprised by his new concern for the inhabitants of Bara Magna. Lifting the mountain under which the Agori and Glatorian are sheltering themselves, he threatens to drop it on them, but Mata Nui retaliates, blasting Makuta with energy. Inside the robot, Tahu and Takanuva witness the quake resulting from Mata Nui's blow and Tahu melts metal falling toward them. The Raksha they are following are scattered too, but quickly reassemble and continue their journey south. The Toa keep pursuing them. On Bara Magna, Mata Nui incinerates the mountain Makuta was holding, saving the Agori. He orders everyone to escape, and Akar convinces Ra'anu to do so, while he and the Glatorian try to help Mata Nui. Makuta reminds Mata Nui he can make him exhaust his power to help his friends and that inside him live the Mataran, but Mata Nui resolves to keep fighting, only to discover Bara Magna's moons are drifting away from the planet and his own power supply is an hour away from depletion. Topic. Chapter 7 In order to assist Mata Nui, the Glatorian attack weak points of the robot under Teridix's control to distract him, while Gresh attempts to penetrate the robot, planning to then destroy everything in sight to disable the Makuta. However, the Thornix used by the Glatorian do not have any visible effect, and are apparently unnoticed by Teridix, though Gresh manages to reach a hatch at the foot of the robot. Unknown to the Glatorian, Teridix has noticed them and, having expected their resistance, carries out his prepared plan of using an assembled army of Raksha and Skakti to combat them. Gresh who is at the entrance of the robot, sees it opening and hides, witnessing the arrival of the army which attacks the Glatorian. Kiina attempts to fight a Raksha of heat vision which fends off her assault and strikes her, knocking her down and robbing her of her weapon, before preparing to deal the final blow. Akar beheads the Raksha and helps Kiina up, when both notice the Raksha's Krata which Akar reduces to ashes, then continuing to combat the Skakti and Raksha. Gresh, indecisive about whether to help his friends or invade the robot, approaches the hatch as Tahu and Takanuva exit ahead of a massive group of Toa. Believing them to be enemies, he strikes, only to be blinded by Takanuva's counterattack. The two Toa prepare to dispatch him when he realizes from their speech that they are allies and informs them of this. Tahu, conversing with Gresh, briefly explains the danger of the Raksha whom his friends are combating, then orders the Toa army to move out. Gresh states his plan but is dissuaded by Takanuva. The Glatorian then rushes off to fight and Takanuva begins to follow when he notices that Tahu has frozen as if in a trance, not responding to the Toa of Light. Watching the battle from atop a hill, Stronius briefly reflects over the Skrull attempt at conquest, wishing for vengeance on the Glatorian who foiled their plan, Mata Nui. He orders the few Skrull he has gathered to attack the Glatorian who have been injured. <laughs> Topic. Chapter 8 Tahu stands where he perceives as Ta Wahi, believing he is under an illusion by Teridix. The Ignica appears to him and explains that the Glatorian and Agori will not survive the battle without help. 
The mask then proceeds to devolve him back into a Toa Mata. As Tahu expresses his anger, the Ignika reveals the details of the golden armor, which can be used to help stop Teridix. It begins to create the armor for him before warning that it can only be used once, and that its use could harm him. Tahu awakens and notices the pieces of the armor appearing on the sand. He and Takanuva are able to retrieve two of the pieces, but Teridix then disperses a blast of energy, scattering the other pieces across the desert. As the Toa of Fire and Light recover, Araksha snatches one of the pieces. Meanwhile, Gresh defeats several Raksha. Before he could go to aid Akar, a piece of the golden armor lands near him. He picks it up, and decides to examine it later, since a Skakti is coming to assault him. Elsewhere on the battlefield, Nectan continues in the brawl against the Glatorians, thinking to himself just how easy it was for him to defeat them. Taking notice of an embattled Raksha nearby, he hesitates to assist it, but he eventually decides to aid it, due to his alliance with Teridix. The warlord then pushes aside an Agori who tried to stop him, before stumbling over a piece of the golden armor. He grabs it, believing it to be something of value, as B thinks that with the battle seeming too short, he might just get some loot to make the battle worth it. Meanwhile, both Mata Nui and Teridix were fighting each other on an almost even level. Mata Nui had been able to do some more damage to Teridix, but Teridix has more energy reserves, and greater strength. Teridix currently has the advantage over Mata Nui, who barely manages to hold his own. Mata Nui fires an energy blast at Teridix in retaliation to one of Teridix's comments, fusing some circuits together again within him, and causing some minor damage. In response, Teridix angrily prepares to crush the planet with gravitational power, which would cause the world to fold upon itself, and would result in the death of everybody on the planet, except for Teridix, and Mata Nui. Topic. Chapter 9 During the minutes before Teridix's blast, Gresh spots Skrull warriors joining the fight and turns to attack them. Spotting a piece of golden armor in one's hand and believing it to be a weapon, he attacks the Skrull with his air power, and manages to get the piece to fly to him, even as three Skrull successfully battle their way through the windstorm, to attack him. Meanwhile, Takanuva is fighting two Raksha of Heat Vision, who are now more resistant to his light powers. He gains the upper hand over one, only to be hit by another one's beams. To save himself, he creates a hologram of himself, tricking the Raksha into hitting each other before finishing them. As he collects a piece of golden armor from one, he vows that it was time to crush Teridix's evil once and for all. At the same time, Tahu is fighting Nectan. The Skakti tries to bait him into fighting without using his power, but Tahu doesn't fall for it. Instead, he uses his power to make his sword hot enough to melt through Nectan's crescent scythe, which cuts it in half. Tahu states pride does not count, only winning does. Nectan counters saying that maybe some of the Skakti, in this case, the Paraka, who had beaten the Toa Nuva bad in Bionicle Legends No. 1 Island of Doom, have beaten them, and then have made the Toa just like them. To this, Tahu says that he fights to save lives, unlike the Skakti, who fight to take them. Challenging this, Nectan carries Tahu into the midst of the battle, so that he can't use his powers without killing his allies, but Tahu flips the Skakti over, which negates Nectan's efforts. When Tahu states he's ready to do anything to win, the Skakti rises up faster than he could have imagined, and chokes him, only to have his armor melted. Tahu then collects the golden armor piece, but leaves the Skakti alive, after knocking him out. Topic. Chapter 10 Just as Teridix releases the gravitational blast, Mata Nui grabs Teridix's arm and jerks it into the air, causing the gravity blast to strike Aqua and Boda Magna instead, drawing them back towards Bara Magna. Teridix pushes Mata Nui away, but he responds with a relentless attack on Teridix, striking too quickly for Teridix to respond, driving him to the northernmost reaches of Bara Magna. Just before he could finish him off at his destination, however, the power of Mata Nui's robot body runs down. In response, Teridix punches Mata Nui, sending him crashing to the ground, and then gloats that he has won. Meanwhile, Tahu and Takanuva have gathered four pieces of the golden armor. 
As they wonder where the other two are, they notice Gresh in a fight with a Skakti, who had defeated the three Skrall warriors earlier. Felling the Skakti with heat and light, they take the two pieces in Gresh's satchel. Quickly, Tahu places them on, and wills the armor's power to activate. Immediately, power surges through him, locking his muscles with electricity, and causing his body to emit a blinding light. As he screams in pain, tendrils of energy launch out from him, coiling around every Raksha on the battlefield. The Raksha fall to the ground, seized by spasms as their power is pulled through the tendrils and into Tahu. Then, the Raksha armor disintegrate, and the Krata inside explode into shards of shadow. With the Raksha dead, the Skakti and Skrall quickly surrender or run away into the desert, as they are now greatly outnumbered. Up above, Turidix feels the deaths of his thousands of Raksha, causing him to hesitate for a moment. Taking advantage of this, Mata Nui shoves Turidix's body into the path of the jungle moon of Bota Magna, which smashes into his head and destroys his core processor, killing Turidix. But without Turidix controlling the robot body, its massive weight causes it to fall towards the desert of Bara Magna, which threatens to kill all of Mata Nui's friends. Using every bit of strength his robot body possessed, Mata Nui quickly pushes Turidix away onto the Black Spike Mountains, which crushes the mountain range to powder. At the same time, Bota Magna and Aqua Magna collide with Bara Magna, merging back into Spheris Magna. Topic. Epilogue Tahu and Takanuva are looking at the fallen robot that houses the Mataran universe as beings begin streaming out. Takanuva wonders if Makut is really gone and if the Mataran can survive on Bara Magna, but Tahu is confident they can. From above, Mata Nui watches the inhabitants of the Mataran universe meet with the Bara Magna's inhabitants and decides to give them a new place to live in. To do that, he combines his last energies with the Kanohi Ignikas and bathes Spherus Magna with life energy, making plants grow everywhere and rivers appear, healing all of the damage done to the planet, and making it even better than it had ever been. The energy also heals those in the pit who have been mutated, which reverses the mutation done to them, while still allowing them to breathe water, and also removes the mutagen in the water, so that no one can be mutated again. But the effort is overwhelming, and because of the strain, and the depletion of energy, the robot falls apart. Kiina and Acker, along with the other combatants Toa, Matarin, Glatorian, Agori, others, etc., race to the site, only to see that nothing is left intact. However, they find the mask of life still intact, which suddenly begins hovering in the air. From the mask, Mata Nui, whose spirit was called back to it, in virtue of having inhabited it for so long, speaks to the assembled crowd, and refuses Tahu's request to remain to guide them. He only asks them to search for the great beings, to make them understand what he, too, has learned during his time on Bara Magna, so that he will be able to look forward to returning, on the day that the great beings return. Mata Nui then stops speaking, as he has gone dormant, and the mask falls into Kiina's hands. Tahu gently takes it from her, and declares that it was time to move on, 